very special occasion for me uh, to be with you on, on this occasion addressing uh, this very important topic. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all of us, and I think uh, especially adults, mental health professionals, uh, we want to see what we can do for youth and, uh, and what, what tools are available to us to help the young people in their development. Um, what I will do, I will um, make some particular comments about development focusing on, on youth. I will talk about uh, some of the strategies that might mitigate stress and, dis and disasters and also um, talk about community responses, uh, some, some practical things uh, that may be possible to do. Um, let's move to the first slide after this. And we start with uh, contrasting the evolutionary strategies of mammals and the coronavirus. It's an evolutionary strategy of mammals uh, to be affiliative, to join in communities, uh, to support each other for the development of the young and for reproduction. It's the evolutionary strategy of the virus to exploit this situation in uh, spreader events and super spreader events uh, that make the virus spread from organism to organism. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graphic of uh, Eric Erickson's stages of development. Um, the first three stages um, in essence are a reproduction of the Freudian stages of development, the foundation for later development. Uh, in early childhood infancy, trust versus mistrust, early childhood autonomy versus shame doubt, preschool initiative versus guilt, and then we have industry versus inferiority, identity versus role confusion, and young adulthood intimacy versus isolation. Um, by coincidence, I think, in English, all of these uh, stages for youth begin with I, the importance of initiative, uh, industry, identity, and intimacy, and those are the developmental stages I'm going to focus on. The next slide shows uh, the schema as a step, a series of steps. And the important point to make from this is that as development progresses, if one of the steps is delayed or lost, it may not be possible or it may be harder for the later steps to move forward. So in the case of the pandemic, uh, it's like taking out some of the blocks uh, that may be important for development. Uh, possibly there may be developmental delays, uh, but in terms of schooling in particular, uh, in terms of social interaction, in terms of the various challenges of each of these stages, the pandemic impacts uh, each of those. This is another schema of Erickson's developmental stages. Uh, there's more information than we need to focus on now. Uh, but just in terms of the, the right-hand column, the final column, thinking about the desired outcomes of hope, will, purpose, confidence, and fidelity, as well as love, care, and wisdom throughout the life cycle. This is the important concept, I think, to keep in mind. Uh, that in terms of caring for others, we need to be sure to take care of ourselves first. Uh, this is the lesson that the flight attendants always give in an airplane. In case of the need for the oxygen mask, be sure to put your own mask on first before helping those around you. Um, 
And I think everything in terms of global mental health uh, underscores that, the importance of taking care of ourselves, learning how to take care of ourselves as we take care of those around us. Then looking at the teen experience, um, teen experience uh, is, is a challenging time of life, particularly a challenging time. It's sort of a tension between uh, the immediate intense desire to do something other than what, it, what we are in the here and now, to be somewhere else, to do something else, and the radical acceptance of the moment. Um, I think all of us can think back to the teen years and say this was an awkward time. Uh, it sometimes said that the major task of adolescence is to learn to deal with disappointment uh, and anxiety. And these are not pathological uh, states. They're challenges for us to deal with. So the challenge is to both allow yourselves to have the intense desire for something else than what is now, and at the same time, be willing to radically accept what you have in your life at the present moment. I think it is unnatural to think that there is such a thing as a blue sky, white clouded, happy childhood for anybody. Childhood is a very, very tricky business for surviving it. Because if one thing goes wrong or anything goes wrong, and usually something does go wrong, then you are compromised as a human being. You're going to trip over that for a good part of your life. Um, there's more information on this slide than we'll be able to absorb, but I want to call attention to it. This is the famous um, Adverse Childhood Experiences study uh, done by Vincent Folletti um, at the Kaiser Permanente Health System and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. It basically talks about 10 adverse experiences. Um, this is in an American system. Kaiser Permanente is a healthcare organization uh, for well-insured people, basically people that had employment uh, through their, had health insurance through their employer. And it identifies 10, possible adverse childhood experiences, uh, abuse, trauma in the child's household environment, and neglect of the child. Uh, the abuse might be emotional abuse, physical abuse, or childhood sexual abuse. The trauma in the childhood could be an alcohol or a drug using uh, person in the household, someone who is chronically depressed, emotionally disturbed, um, witnessing the mother treated violently um, and someone uh, imprisoned or not being raised by both biological parents and then a neglect, either physical neglect or emotional neglect. Adverse childhood experiences leads to a number of adverse coping strategies or maladaptive coping strategies, such as alcohol or drug use, repeating the trauma, cigarette smoking, etc., which may lead to a number of adverse health outcomes. Uh, the figures at the right suggest that if you have more than four adverse childhood experiences, you're seven times as likely to use alcohol, you're twice as likely to have sex before age of 15, you're twice as likely to have cancer, and four times as likely to have emphysema. And if you have more than six adverse childhood experiences, uh, you're 30 times more likely to make a suicide attempt. Um, as I mentioned, these are U.S. data, uh, but there's an international scale as well, and I think many of the same principles apply in other places. You can move to the next slide. There are three, um, three phases to this slide. The first one is a traumatic event, such as seeing uh, being a witness to some traumatic, like seeing a, a, a car crash or car in flames. Um, and the second is the game Tetris, which probably most of you are familiar with uh, and have played it sometime uh, as a distraction. And then the third is the uh, picture of the brain and talking about 
memory being consolidated in the brain. The implication of this study by Holmes and others uh, is that uh, a visuospatial task, such as playing Tetris or other video game, uh, delays the consolidation or prevents the uh, traumatic memory from being stored in the brain. Now, often we think of, of teens as being distracted by, by loud music or uh, when they should be studying or playing video games and they should be concentrating. And there actually may be a developmental uh, purpose for this that's actually adaptive. Um, so to keep that in mind. Now, here's a uh, pop quiz right in the middle of my presentation. Uh, the smallest unit of health is the cell, the individual, the community, and the nation. So let me just invite you to commit yourself uh, to one of those A, B, C, or D. And uh, uh, you won't be graded on this, of course, but as we move forward, the answer will be clear if, even if the uh, implication is not. Wendell Berry is an American agrarian uh, philosopher. He's a farmer as well as a teacher, and he's written a great deal of essays and poetry uh, that many of us admire. And he says, and I believe with him, that the community in the fullest sense, a place in all its creatures, is the smallest unit of health. And that to speak of health as an, of an isolated individual is a contradiction of terms. When we think of the impact of the COVID pandemic on youth, I think it's important to think of the communities that support the youth and the importance of paying attention to their needs and what communities can do. Um, there may be individuals who will need mental health assistance. That's always the case. Um, uh, but it's important that the community resources be responsive to the needs of the children. The next slide is a favorite of mine. Um, these are pictures I took in Tamil Nadu uh, after the tsunami there in 2004. Uh, I was privileged to be there with a the team from Nimhounds uh, on the one year anniversary. Uh, the boy on the left, uh, this is a, a picture of a poster uh, says, I was very scared to sleep. I got nightmares. I want to play with friends all the time so that I feel better. What he's basically talking about is the way the memories of the tsunami could be overcome, become overwhelming, and he, um, he distracts himself by playing with friends. The two boys in the right-hand side of the picture um, were able to survived the tsunami by scampering up palm trees uh, with their agility. Uh, I believe both of them lost their mothers, uh, but they look quite happy in this because the community is reforming around them. This is the stress story in a nutshell. And the point that I want to make about this particularly is this stress is a state of the individual, individual state of uncertainty about what needs to be done to safeguard physical, mental, and social well-being. Uh, basically, stress is what the brain does to itself and other parts of the body when a stressor is perceived as a separation threat or a challenge or even an uncertain attachment opportunity. Um, the first basic stress in life that we have to deal with is separation anxiety. And if we think back to the zebras uh, in the first slide, uh, these are the attachments that become so important. And uh, stress is basically some derivative of separation of those attachments. Stress can be normal and maybe even uh, an opportunity. It can be tolerable, but it can become toxic. So in the slide, the green is, is good stress, eustress, uh, such as the stress of anticipating an examination, uh, which then becomes a signal to prepare for that examination. But if there's too much stress, too much going on, it becomes toxic and disruptive. Um, let's move to the next slide, which explains a bit of the physiology of the stress reaction.
Um, the, th this shows the pathways, and we don't need to go into them in great detail, uh, from the forebrain and the brain stem to the hypothalamus to the anterior, anterior pituitary to the adrenal cortex, uh, which produces adrenaline, but also produces cortisol, which can be protective in a stress situation. But too much cortisol um, can be disruptive of, of the human physiology. And I've drawn this, uh, reproduced this, uh, to show that uh, post-traumatic stress is often thought of in terms of something that happens in an instant. Uh, I've coined the term ongoing traumatic stress to suggest the, the negative impacts of, of uh, a, a situation like the pandemic or like living in a war zone, uh, as was for many people in Iraq and is currently the situation in Ukraine. So, yeah, we can move to the next slide now. And this is the basically the nervous system, the uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system, the, which is the fight or flight reaction. And uh, basically what this slide illustrates is that the adrenaline has the impact on all of the systems of the body. And what we would hope to do in a uh, fight or flight situation is to invoke the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the relaxation response. Um, the book by Herbert Benson, uh, Herbert Benson was a cardiologist who studied this and, and wrote this, this famous book. Um, he recently died just a few months ago and his obituary has been, has been published. But this is a great contribution in terms of mind-body medicine, not to think of these things as just psychological experiences, but experiences which impact uh, the whole body. Now I wanna talk about this turtle um, and tell you a little personal story about it. Uh, the boat is called Resilience. Coincidentally, uh, it's kind of a nice, often boats have cute little names like Resilience. Um, and some years ago, my family and I took a vacation in the British Virgin Islands, uh, not on such a big boat as that, more like a little boat like in the foreground, which is still a pretty big boat. And uh, we uh, stopped for lunch and spent some time, uh, and there was a turtle beside the boat, and the turtle would go down underwater fishing, and then would come up, and then would go down, and then would come up. And we decided that we would time it, and it would stay down for 11 minutes before it had to come up for air. 11 minutes underwater, and then come up for air. Now, the thing that was quite remarkable in my agenda-driven life, basically, I rarely have an opportunity to watch a turtle over and over again in its cycle of going fishing and then coming up and breathing. But what I found, especially as I think about it in retrospect, is that as the turtle was going up and down, swimming up and down, as we were bobbing up and down on the, on the deck of the boat, uh, I became, and I think all of us became, more relaxed watching that turtle. So the next slide makes the analogy from the turtle to the mammalian brain, the human brain, and, and what you basically see is the human brain in two states, in the left, the alert state, and in the right, the stressed state. Now the stressed state is basically the reptilian brain. It's just the brain stem without too much input from the, uh, from the cortex, from the upper levels of the brain. Um, the alert brain, and we might be calling this top down or in this case, right to left, uh, where the cortex gets involved and helps us process what's going on uh, so that we can become alert and attentive and also more relaxed and less reactive as in the case of the stress brain. Okay, so the psychological stressors of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic, prolonged exposure to high levels of threat, 
uncertainty, self-blame for inadvertent harm to others, and especially the absence of relational coping. Uh, relational coping is a way that that humans can uh, can cope with what's going on in their environment. Uh, they're not alone; they're with others. But the pandemic has threatened that, threatened it uh, in terms of of our accustomed way of coping with the stresses in our life. Next slide, please. Now, um, this is a, uh, a, a vocabulary, in a sense, uh, for response to a disaster. Um, it suggests a disaster such as a hurricane or a tsunami, uh, an earthquake, uh, where there's a discrete event and then uh, the pre-disaster phase, uh, a moderate level of stress, the impact, uh, the intensity, a honeymoon phase typically where the community comes together and then some disillusionment, triggering events, anniversary reactions, and then working through grief and loss with a reconstruction. Now, the difference, and much of this applies in the pandemic, but all of these stages may be prolonged as we go into the third year of the pandemic, uh, coping with the losses, coping with the disruptions, coping with changes that we hadn't anticipated, uh, such as particularly for, for youth school disruptions. Um, and, and something, and this is an American example, I think, but maybe not just American. There's a great deal of concern for American boys and I think, I think it uh, derives from the impact of the pandemic on the idea of a of a projected life path, and the and the disruption of that in the sense of will there be a career? Will there be a vocation? Will I be able to do something meaningful with my life, uh, even supporting a family? Now, this is not to say that girls don't have stresses as well and and the disruptions of their development. Um, but I think this is a major concern, and this may be a, a good place to talk about that. Okay, um, next, please. So um, this is the stress graph again, and the suggestion that there being you stress or good stress, uh, the kind of stress that's motivating anticipatory, such as I mentioned an algebra exam or a history exam, and then the distress when it becomes overwhelming, negative, uh, short-term or long-term, uh, unpleasant performance decreases, and le may lead to burnout. And again, to give you an American example, uh, physicians and nurses, healthcare providers uh, are experiencing a lot of burnout and a lot of people are retiring, perhaps retiring early uh, because of the ongoing stress uh, without relief. Okay. Shall we move on? Okay, so here are some of the things uh, that one might do. Uh, mindful pausing, deep breathing, body scan, being aware of where you carry attention in your body, and then guided imagery. Imagine a place where you feel safe and secure. And then to have this conversation. And in the next slide, um, the, the images are similar. The first is a, a photograph that my uh, nep my niece took, and then the second is a similar uh, image um, by a famous artist, Alex Katz, and uh, and and I love it. For me, this is a, a, a mindful pausing image, um, and then here are some of the uh, the different uh, ways of representing the same thing: uh, the mindful breathing the four, 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 four square breathing, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Or the one that I like, especially for children, is the starfish uh, breathing. So inhale as you go up the thumb, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale, and maybe even do it more slowly than I illustrated it there. Um, 
We have two grandchildren, ages six and four, who sometimes get rambunctious, and introducing breathing for them gives them a sense of mastery and that starfish is something that they can do and, and find useful. So next slide. And this is the WHO pyramid, which suggests that not everyone will need uh, intensive medical, psychiatric, or psychological treatment, that a lot can be done in terms of self-care, informal community care. And one of the examples of that is um, in Zimbabwe, grandmothers on a bench that are trained to deal with postpartum depression uh, in places where um, higher level services may not be available. Um, in the tsunami affected vis villages, uh, Nimhan's teams trained teachers and community level workers on any of the things that they could do to help individuals in the community, but basically to support the community and supporting the individuals that are impacted by the tsunami. Psychological skills for non-psychologists. This is what I call the resilience curriculum. Uh, in the introduction that was mentioned, several of the areas, uh, disaster affected areas like the uh, Great Sichuan earthquake in China or the uh, Japan triple disaster after the tsunami, uh, earthquake tsunami and nuclear disaster there. Uh, psychological first aid, which I know you're familiar with, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is some of the things I was just illustrating, uh, something called HOPE modules, which we've developed at George Washington University, uh, basically asking people how they have coped with adversity in the past, and then reinforcing that and talking with them about how they might uh, use some of the skills that they have used in the past, like someone says, well, I would call my mother, and that's a kind of relational coping. Um, or uh, reasoning through a situation would be another example of, of hope modules, and then to, to re, redevelop hope by relying on skills that they already have, and then compassionate listening. Breathe Like a Bear. Um, this is a children's book that suggests a number of different ways of breathing. Uh, here's the bear breath, but there are other uh, snake breath and uh, raccoon breath and, and all sorts of animals and so forth. Uh, a way of helping children be aware of their own bodies, particularly focusing on, on the breathing, which is so important. What is a resilient community? I'm asking, uh, inviting you to reflect on this. One definition has been given this shock or a crunch condition will teach, empower, and change the person or the cluster of people that were affected by it while they were working hard to manage difficult consequences and trying to downsize its damaging effects in their lives. We might think of better definitions and often this uh, talk of building back better after a disaster. And so part of that is building back the physical infrastructure, uh, building back the buildings or whatever was destroyed, but also building back the community in a way that, um, that it's better able to respond to future disasters. A couple of cartoons here uh, that I wanna share with you because of the irony involved in them. The man is talking to his doctor who says, I see, and have you tried worrying about it? The suggestion being that worrying may not be useful, but in truth, naming your concerns, naming your stress, naming your worry may help you in dealing with it. So if the doctor said to you, uh, have you tried worrying about it? Uh, that's not a necessarily a dismissive comment. Here are some of the things that Resilience Man suggests. Regular, moderate physical exercise. Plenty of sleep. Tell stories often by writing and talking with others. Prayer or meditation. The strength of social support networks is important. Stay in touch with loved ones. 
and um, spread out your deployments or spread, spread out your work tasks, take long breaks, adequate vacation leave, and talk with a counselor if thoughts or feelings get in the way. Um, there's an advertisement on American television now. Uh, it says, uh, it's okay to ask for help and uh, there are resources available. Um, it encourages people to get help and hopefully overcome some of the stigma that's associated with mental health care. Okay. Now again, there's irony in this slide. Uh, awareness is the first step. And the guy says, stress, what stress? Uh, like he's unaware that he's stressed out. Uh, so stay in touch with your emotions. And then um, this is my final slide and I hope to leave a little time for discussion. And I see there we do have uh, about uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, I live in a forest now and in the walk, there's a, a, there's a creek and a bridge that one goes across. And when one goes through the forest from one section to another, uh, the children put up little things. They paint the rocks, uh, believe, be happy, have fun, uh, just dance, and uh, put up little pinwheels and things like that. So they, they're spreading joy in the forest and a kind of reminder to the other kids and to adults um, to relax and be joyful. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I see there are a lot of you here and I would be glad to entertain some reactions or questions if you have any. Dear uh, delegates, if you have uh, any questions or clarification to be sought, or if you would like to add on anything to what uh, Dr. Alan Dyer spoke, you may please uh, do that now. So very good morning to all. Can I hear, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very much, sir. Uh, I'm Devendran from Mizoram University. Uh, it's very nice to hear uh, Professor Allen's uh, lecture. It was so uh, wonderful and it is also in need of the R and uh, 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 especially among the youngsters in Indian context, uh, already this, this uh, type of uh, the breathing exercises uh, in, a, in, in a scientific uh, way, uh, you have explained. So uh, let me elaborate some of that uh, box technique. I would like to know the, that's what I want to know, uh, how it can be processed. The starfish, I understood it very nicely. Kindly explain that particular, the box type of breathing to as little. Sure. Um, the four, so four, four, four methods. Yeah. Um, it, it's also called square breathing. And I, I went through it a little bit quickly because the idea is to slow down, um, taking a deep breath and maybe starting with um, making sure it's a diaphragmatic breath so that as one takes a deep breath in, the belly actually goes out. Now for people that are already a little bit heavier than they would like to be, uh, they may not want the belly to go out, but uh, that's a way of knowing that you're taking a full breath in and really filling the lungs. And so um, when the lungs are full, there's more oxygen to go into the bloodstream that goes to the heart and goes to the brain so that it gets more oxygen so it can process whatever the stress is and think about it more calmly. Um, so a deep breath in, maybe on account of four, Inhale, hold the breath, exhale, relax, repeat. So that's the square, it has those four components. Inhale, hold the breath, exhale, relax. And, um, what I've found if, if we took time to do this, and I won't suggest taking time to do this but you right now, uh, but you can do it on your own at some time, is 
take your pulse. Let's see. Find your pulse, take your pulse. Uh, if you do it for 10 seconds, multiply by six or six seconds, multiply by 10 per minute, and then do the breathing exercises, and then take the pulse again. And most people will find, not all people, but most people will find that they can lower their pulse simply by breathing. And what this exercise where I showed the three steps, um, the, uh, the mindful breathing, uh, the body scan, the guided imagery, <coughs> um, I call five minute yoga. And many people will say, well, I can't take five minutes. Uh, in transcendental meditation, uh, it's a 15 minute exercise twice a day, but busy people often complain that they can't take the time or it takes too much time. Um, but it can be done in a minute, a minute of doing this, or even sometimes just take a deep breath, one deep breath, uh, and that, that begins to make the difference. So centering on the breathing becomes very important. Um, often in sleeping, people who have difficulty sleeping, uh, sleep is a time to sort of put the anxieties of the day aside. And it used to be suggested counting sheep. Um, the modern version of this is to focus on one's breathing. Uh, and that actually has a psychological effect of distracting oneself, but also the physiological effect of providing oxygen to the brain and to the muscles. Thank you, sir. And of course, to say, and particularly in the Himalayan areas, uh, the yogi masters have, have figured this out long ago. And, uh, and that's not just a five minute exercise, that's a real discipline. But, um, but to acknowledge that, because it's very important. Thank you very much for your clear explanation, sir. Yeah, you're very welcome and thanks for the question. I would like to say a few words about uh, Ellen uh, lecture. Please. Uh, uh, it was very interesting and very uh, uh, informative, uh, especially for youth during this sort of a disaster and crisis, how to remain psychologically more stable, strong, resilient uh, in the present crisis situation. <clears throat> and the crisis situation varies from youth to youth because of their living condition, economic condition, <clears throat> and uh, support facilities. So uh, I think this breathing exercise and those exercises does not involve any cost or money. It requires reinforcement so that they practice and get the benefit uh, out of it. So once again, I thank Ellen Dyer for uh, accepting our invitation, uh, giving such an interesting, important lecture in this platform. And I would like to share with everyone that uh, Ellen was very kind enough to write forward for our book on health and well-being, uh, Springer Handbook of Health and Well-being, and his uh, uh, small uh, uh, pre uh, 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 forward was uh, very good. Uh, I would say uh, very uh, 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 interesting as well as uh, impressive, motivating for all of us. And I tell you the another connection of my uh, 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 interaction with Ellen, my friend is there, Shubhashit Vadra. He's there. And he has been working with Ellen Dyer for a long time. And Shubhashit Vadra connected me to Ellen Dyer. And then today we are here, all of us in the same platform. So it gives an idea that this entire world is a small global village. And for academicians, there is no boundary. We can, uh, we can get ourselves connected to the good uh, resource person to learn from their knowledge and experience. So we are very happy, uh, Elaine, for delivering the lecture. I thank uh, Dr. Shwashit Bhadra for introducing me to such a great academic uh, uh, stal uh, stalwart and, uh, and, and for his, this lecture. So on behalf of the organizing committee member, all the participants, I profusely uh, uh, give you a special thank uh, for your 
deliberation on LSD. So, so thank you for all of that. And, and I have to say with Subhashish here, uh, when I first went to Tamil Nadu and he spent from morning till night telling me what was going on with the, with the Nimhans teams in the disaster affected villages by the tsunami. And I really learned a great deal from him then and have continued to learn from him from, from my associations over the, what are we talking about now, 20 some odd years. So thank you. And you'll be very happy, Ellen, that I uh, identified uh, Shwashil Bhadra in a conference in Pondicherry University. I happened to be one of the participants. I was listening to him. So I was impressed by his ideas concept. And then afterwards, I invited him to join me in writing a book. The book has been published by Pearson on childhood to adolescence. Now he's a co-author with me in the same book. This is how we double upon network and understanding and take forward various academic activities. So I feel so happy that I am blessed by the association of so many good people in my life. Thank you. Thank you, sir, <laughs> for all you Thank you very Thank much. You.